Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Math 221. So today we are going to get into a very exciting topic, which is cryptography. And I'm going to show you how to encrypt and decrypt messages. And in order to do this, we're going to need to learn a little bit about modular arithmetic. So let's get right into it. Okay, so first let's talk just a little bit about what cryptography is and define some terms. So cryptography is the study of methods for sending secret messages. Uh, there is actually a journal book um, all about this topic, uh, which is quite interesting if, if you want to read that. Uh, I don't remember offhand what the title is. I think it's called The Code Book. Um, anyway, so the original message in English, that's called the plain text, and the encoded message is called ciphertext. Encryption is the process of turning plain text into ciphertext, and decryption is the process of turning ciphertext into plain text. And then a crypto system. Uh, it's a set of algorithms f that does a bunch of different things. So it represents the message as numbers instead of letters, and then it encrypts the message, and it, there would also be an algorithm for decrypting the message. And there could be some other things in there as well, like um, there's a lot of kind of uh, kind of extraneous things like padding messages, um, uh, breaking messages into blocks, um, exchanging keys, things like that. So cryptography, obviously this is really important in our modern world as um, a lot of apps and different things use encryption. And uh, also for those of you who are you know, planning to graduate and get a job, um, you might be interested to know that the largest employer of mathematicians in the US is the National Security Agency. And they mainly do intelligence and also encryption. So they employ a whole um, division of mathematicians. Okay, so let's talk about the most basic type of cipher, and uh, you might be surprised to find out just how much pretty much every crypto system is similar to this. Uh, so let's start here. This is called a Caesar cipher, and it's called a Caesar cipher because Caesar supposedly used um, one of these ciphers. So for a fixed number K, a Caesar cipher, all you do is you just replace each letter of the alphabet with the letter that is K spaces further along in the alphabet. And then once you get to the end of the alphabet and you can't sort of go further along, you just loop back around to the beginning of the alphabet. Okay, so for this example, um, K is three. So we're replacing A, if you just go three spaces down the alphabet, you go B, C, and then you get to D. So you re replace A with D, replace B with E, replace C with F. And then when you get to the end of the alphabet, so W will be replaced with Z, then you just loop back around to the beginning. So you replace X with A, replace Y with B, and replace Z with C. So this is actually, um, I've drawn it with the little arrows there, and you can really think of this as a function from the letters to the letters. Um, and the decryption, you just reverse all the little arrows. So you map uh, D back to A, E goes back to B, F goes back to C, and then you just reverse all of those uh, to decrypt. Okay, so we talked about how you can replace letters with other letters using the uh, Caesar cipher, but you know, most of the time you're not gonna be doing this by hand, you're gonna be doing it with a computer. So we really need ways to represent letters with numbers. And so the most basic way of representing letters with numbers is just by this little table right here. So you let the letter A be the number one, and then letter B is number two, letter C is number three, and so on and so forth. And then Y is 25, Z is 26. So obviously this leaves out a lot of things that you might want like spaces and punctuation, but we're just gonna stick with this for now just to keep it um, simple. So then uh, if we're using numbers instead of letters, then we can write actual formulas for um, how to encrypt and decrypt. So the variables that we'll be using in our formula are this. So we're gonna have M, that will stand for the number of the message letter. So if your message that you wanna send is the letter B, for example, then M would be two, okay? And then C is gonna stand for the number of the ciphertext letter. So if you have a ciphertext that you're trying to decrypt and it is, for example, um, the letter Z, then C would be 26, okay? So those are just the variables that we're gonna use in our formulas and it's M for message and C for ciphertext. So this formula right here, C equals M plus K mod 26. This is the formula that would move each letter uh, K spaces further down the alphabet. And then it will also loop it back around to the beginning of the alphabet when you get to the end. So the purpose of the mod 26 here is to, to cause that looping behavior to go back around to the beginning of the alphabet. Um, generally speaking for the computer scientists in the class, um, whenever you're using the mod operation in computer science, you're trying to implement some kind of looping behavior. Um, for example, like navigating around on a little, um, like a little keypad when you're trying to um, 
like when you're trying to use your PlayStation or your Xbox or even like your TV remote to, to enter some text and you have a little uh, keyboard there and you're just pressing the left and right arrows and you go over to the left of the screen and then it like loops back around to the right. Um, they're using a mod formula for that. So anyway, that's what the mod is there for. And then, so this is our encryption formula. We add K to the message to get the ciphertext. And then, so for the decryption, you take the ciphertext and you subtract K from it. And that gives you back what the original message was. And you're still doing that mod 26. Okay, so let's look at this example over here. So where K is equal to 15. So we're sliding each letter 15 spaces down the alphabet. So what you would do is you would split your plain text message into five letters like this. And then you want to represent each of those letters with its number in the alphabet. So H is the eighth letter of the alphabet, E is the fifth letter of the alphabet, L is the twelfth letter, and then O is the fifteenth letter. So those are the five values of M that we're going to be using. And then you just plug those values of M into this formula right here to get C. So you just add 15 and mod by 26, add 15, mod by 26, and you just do that for all of them and you get these numbers that are over here. And then you just take those and you translate those back into text. So 23, the 23rd letter of the alphabet is W, the 20th letter of the alphabet is T, the first letter is A, and the third letter is C. Okay, so that is how you use this Caesar cipher formula. Now, um, one of the things to know about the Caesar cipher, of course, it's the easiest crypto system to understand, and it's also the easiest one to break. Um, I don't know if you guys remember the days of reading newspapers and doing like uh, crosswords in the newspapers, but they used to have this puzzle in the newspaper where it was exactly a, a Caesar cipher that you had to decrypt. Um, I used to solve those a lot. Uh, so yeah, even just one human without a computer or a calculator can, can decrypt these messages without knowing um, what K is, because all you have to do is you just have to try all of the 26 possible values of, of K and, uh, and then you can figure out what the message is. So 26, different Ks to try is, is not very hard. Okay, so let's talk about a better way of encryption that would be uh, more secure than the Caesar cipher. So this is actually, it's really the same as the Caesar cipher, but it's just um, using a little more complicated representation system. So the idea is to exchange groups of letters with other groups of letters um, that are not just single letters. So for example, we could write out the list of all 17,576 groups of three letters. So starting with AAA and then going to AAB and then AAC and just continue like that in alphabetical order until you get to ZZZ. So there are 17,576 triples of letters like that. And so you could represent triples of letters instead of just single letters and, um, and then you could just do a Caesar cipher on that, okay? So your Caesar cipher formula here would be this. So it's exactly the same as before, except uh, you're just modding by a much larger number. So you do get a much larger number there, but uh, unfortunately, of course, someone with a computer can easily try 17,576 different decryptions um, and just see which one is English. Uh, that's not very hard to try. So you really need something that is much more secure than this. Uh, but this is a good start. And uh, I should tell you that in, in real crypto systems, they do block the letters like this, except they typically, I think, use much larger blocks than just three letters. OK, so we want an even stronger encryption scheme than that. So a better idea than just exchanging triples of letters with other triples of letters um, so instead of just shifting down the list by a set amount, what you really want is some other formula that mixes up the triples a bit more. So like instead of just going five places down the list, you want to have them just go to random places. So you could make a table by hand um, of every triple of letters and then what you want to replace it with and then mix up, mix up the entries um, as much as you want, make it as random as possible. And in fact, that would be a really, really, really good way of doing it because there would be this many different ways of arranging those triples of letters. So 17,576 is not a very large number, but 17,576 factorial, which is the number of ways to arrange 17,576 different um, things in a list, that is an extremely large number. It's this large. Look at that exponent. That would take you more than the time left in the universe <laughs> to, to try to crack that. Um, so that would be extremely hard to, to attack. Um, however, 
this does have a huge vulnerability, this idea, which is the following, um, that you would have to record your encryption table. So however you decided to exchange those triples of letters, you would have to write that down, and then you would have to send that to whoever was decrypting the message. And if you're having to send that um, decryption key along with it, then it's really not very secure at all. You might as well have not even encrypted it if you're just going to send the key along with it. So where does that leave us? So that brings us to the idea of a key. So whatever information that you need to encrypt or to decrypt a ciphertext, that is called the key. And keys themselves, as I said, they're very vulnerable to attack. And there are a lot of protocols that have been invented over the years for exchanging them safely, and those are called key exchanges. And that's like a whole sub area of cryptography is key exchanges. So one of the most important types of uh, key exchange is public key cryptography. So public key cryptography, that refers to any crypto system in which the desired recipient of an encrypted message sends the encryptor just enough information to be able to encrypt messages, but not enough to be able to decrypt them. So what that means is that that prevents the full key from ever being publicly exposed. You do not ever have to send the, the full key um, out in public. And that's very, very important because over the internet nowadays, everything is being done publicly. People can see your public keys. There's no way to keep it secret. Um, but you still can't decrypt, even if you know that public key, because it's just a little bit of information. It's enough to encrypt, but it's not enough to decrypt. And only the person who comes up with the key um, has the information for decrypting. Okay, so let's talk now about the concept of functions for encryption. So we talked about the idea of writing down every possible triple of letters and then just figuring out how we want to exchange those triples of letters. Um, but you really don't want to do it by just shifting along the list by a set amount. That's, that's not a good way to do it. That's very vulnerable to attack. So what you really want is some other formula that's going to mix up those triples of letters um, a little more. So for example, you could do something like this. So what about instead of just adding a number to M, so instead of adding a number to the plain text, uh, what if you squared it instead? And then you modded by 17,576. So here, that, that number is still coming from, that's how many triples of letters uh, in the English alphabet there are. So what if you did this instead? So this is, this is superior to the idea of just shifting down the list. Um, but the problem that you run into is how are you going to decrypt this? So what would the decryption formula be? So if you want to undo the operation of squaring, um, so far to this point in your math career, the only way you know to undo a square is to take a square root like this. So if C is the square of M, then M should be the square root of C. But the problem here is that everything is, needs to be done with integers because we're doing this um, we're representing these letters as integers. So if I get a decimal, then that's not a letter, right? Um, so that's a big problem. Okay, so what we actually need for encryption is we need functions that are one-to-one -one correspondences. And remember that a one-to-one -one correspondence, that means that um, the function is one-to-one -one and is onto. And the reason we need this type of function is we need there to be an inverse function that will serve as the decryption formula. Okay, so if you have some, uh, for example, if you have some way of encrypting where you're using a function like this, you plug m uh, into a function and then you get your ciphertext, then you're going to need this to be able to get your message back from the inverse function by applying that to c. Okay, so the only functions that are going to be invertible are going to be those that are one-to-one -one correspondences. And then the other thing that we also need is we need to be able to easily figure out what the inverse functions are, because those are going to be our decryption formulas uh, without resorting to a table. Uh, so that brings us uh, to this point here, that we need to be able to solve equations like these equations right here. So c equals m to the k, or c equals m times k mod n. Uh, so the idea of needing to solve those kinds of modular equations, those, led, uh, those problems led historically to the development of modular arithmetic, and modular arithmetic is really the foundation of modern cryptography. Um, so that's what we're going to talk about next. We're going to go over some, some different theorems and things. Uh, and modular arithmetic is based on congruence modulo n. So the first thing we're going to do is review the concept of congruence modulo n and look at it a little more deeply. Okay, so the first thing that I want to remind you of when it comes to modulo n is that we've used mod n in a couple of different ways that are related to each other, but they're slightly different. So when you use this notation here, 
uh, you have the little triple line here, and then you have your mod n in, in parentheses like this. This is a statement that a and b are congruent modulo n. On the other hand, if you use this notation here, where you have not got parentheses around the mod, that is actually an operation, and it's the operation that returns the remainder of long division when b is divided by n. So these two concepts are related, but they're not identical, and in particular the two types of notation um, are easy to get mixed up with each other. So it's important that you understand the, the difference between those two things. And I'm going to remind you what this one means um, on the next slide. Uh, this one means. Um, I'm going to remind you of that on the next slide. Uh, but first, uh, let me remind you about something called the quotient remainder theorem, uh, which states the following. Uh, when you have long division, you're doing long division, and you divide uh, b by n, you get an integer quotient, which I'll call q, and you also get an integer remainder, which we can call r. And you get these two things, that r is going to be in this uh, limited range here, so it's between 0 inclusive and n non-inclusive. And you're able to write b in this form right here, where b equals n times the quotient plus the remainder. Okay, so let me just maybe do a, like a little quick example. For example, um, b equals, let's say, uh, 10, and um, n equals 3. So then if we divide 10 by 3, so we do long division, uh, then we get a quotient, 3, and then you multiply uh, the quotient times n, you get 9, and then you subtract, and that leaves you the remainder like that. So 3 there is q, and 1 is r. And another way to think of this is if you start with 10 and you just gather up all the copies of 3 or of n, then you have 3 of them. And what does that leave you left over? Then you've got left over 1. Okay, so this is n, q, and r, and this is b. Okay, so now let's go over this theorem 8.4.1, modular equivalences, which outlines all of the ways in which uh, the two usages of mod n are related and, and what they all mean. So let a, b, and n be any integers, and then suppose that n is greater than 1. The following statements are all equivalent. So I said that I was going to tell you um, what this notation right here means, and it is usually defined as meaning number 1 up here, but all five of these statements here are equivalent, so you can think of this uh, a is congruent to b mod n notation, you can think of that as meaning any of these other four statements. So it means that n divides the difference a minus b. It also means that we can write a as b plus k times n for some integer k. So in other words, this, this equation right here is saying that a and b are separated uh, by a distance that is a multiple of n. And that's basically what, exactly what this first one up here is also saying, that the difference between those two numbers is a multiple of n. And then a, a couple of other ways to think of it, 4 and 5. 4 and 5 are really saying the exact same thing, except 5 is using a, the notation and 4 is just saying it in English. So 4 is saying a and b have the same non-negative remainder when divided by n. And then 5 is saying exactly the same thing. So on the left here, this a mod n, that is the remainder that you get when you divide a by n. And on the right here, we have b mod n, and that is the remainder of b when you divide it by n. I'm sorry, my cat is making a huge fuss. Just a moment. Okay, so now that I've calmed my cat down, uh, let's look at this example here. And so we're just going to uh, look at these numbers here. A is going to be 67, B is going to be 32, and N is going to be 7. And then we're going to verify that all five of those statements in the theorem uh, are true in this case. Okay, so for part A here, we just want to verify that uh, 7 divides 68 minus 33. So let's calculate 68 minus 33. So that is going to be 35, and so 7 does divide uh, 35, because 35 is 7 times an integer, 5. Okay, so that's the, the first statement up here, this one. And now for part B, explain why 68 is congruent to 33 mod 7. Um, so 68 is congruent to 33 mod 7. So the definition of what that notation means is just simply um, part A. So this is just because 7 divides 68 minus 
33. Okay, and then part C, what value of k has the property that 68 equals 33 plus 7k? So we can write 68 as 33 plus 35, so that's just coming from um, that equation in the part A there, and then 35 can be split up into 7 uh, times 5, and so the k here is 5. All right, and then for part D, what is the non-negative remainder obtained when 68 is divided by 7 and then when 33 is divided by 7? So let's actually go ahead and do that long division. So if I do 68 divided by 7, um, okay, so how many times does 7 go into 68? Let's see, I think that 7 times 9 is 63, so this will go in 9 times, and then I get 63. And then for my remainder, I subtract and I get 5. And then similarly um, for 33. So how many times does 7 go into 33? So I think 28 is the closest multiple of 7. Um, so this is going to go in 4 times. And then I get 28. And then I subtract and I get 5 as well. Um, so in both cases there, we get 5. And then so for part E, um, 68 mod 7, that is the positive remainder that you get when you do the long division of 68 divided by 7, so this is 5. And then 33 mod 7, again that's the positive remainder that you get when you divide 33 by 7, so this is also 5. So that's why they are equal. Okay, so we confirmed that uh, these five parts of the theorem are all true when a is 67, b is 32, and n is 7. Okay, so here is your homework problem. It's uh, exactly the same as what I just did, so go ahead and give this a try, and then check the answer in the back of the textbook. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about modular arithmetic, and what I mean by modular arithmetic is performing arithmetic uh, modulo n. So that's going to be outlined in this theorem here, theorem 8.4.3. So let a, b, c, d, and n be integers, and then n is greater than 1. And suppose that we know these two things here, that a is congruent to c mod n, and also that b is congruent to d mod n. Then we can say all four of these things down here. So if we add a plus b and we add c plus d, those will still be congruent to each other modulo n. So it's basically like we just took the two congruences that we started with and we added together the left sides and then we added together the right sides and they are still congruent. Just like when you add two equations together and, you, and they're still equal. And then you can also do that by subtraction like this. So a minus b will be congruent to c minus d. And then you can multiply them together as well. a times b will be congruent to c times d. And you can even raise both sides of a congruence to the same exponent. So um, these are all basically the same things that you can do to equations. You can add two equations together, you can subtract two equations from each other, you can multiply the left sides of two equations and get the product of the right sides of the two equations, and then you can raise both sides of an equation to the same integer. So you can actually do all of the same things with modular arithmetic, and that is really, really useful. Um, so here's a corollary to the, the last slide, and this um, might seem a bit kind of confusing, but this will be very useful for our purposes in doing uh, the uh, encryption algorithms. So let a, b, and n be integers with n greater than 1. Then we can say the following. a, b is congruent to a mod n times b mod n modulo n. So here, I think this is the first time we've actually mixed together these two different notations in one statement, but just to remind you, this this is an operation and this one here is also an operation, and it's the operation that return the remainder after you do long division of a by n or of b by n. And then this one, this one is a statement. So it's part of a statement. It's saying that the left side a times b is congruent to the right side a mod n times b mod n, and it's congruent modulo n. Okay, and then um, Similarly, uh, another way you could say it is like this. So you can also do the mod n operation to the left side of that congruence there. And then even more importantly, this one is actually the most useful for, 
for the encryption method that we're going to go over later is if you want to raise a to an exponent and then uh, you can actually do the mod operation inside of the parentheses like that. So you can do mod n operation to a before raising it to the exponent and uh, you'll get a result that is congruent to the left side here, uh, modulo n. So these are going to be really useful for our purposes and let's just go over a couple of examples of how to use them. Okay, so let's look at this example here. So we're just going to verify that these uh, statements in the theorem were actually true and that they work and we'll see how they work. Uh, so let's verify part A here. So is 45 really congruent to 3 mod 6 and is 104 really congruent to 2 mod 6? Um, so that is basically, it's the same as this uh, part up here at the beginning of the theorem. So let's see, is 45 congruent to 3 mod 6? So what do I have to check? I have to check that 45 minus 3 is divisible by 6. So 45 minus 3 is 42, and that is 6 times 7. So that means that 6 divides 45 minus 3. So yes, that tells me that 45 is congruent to 3 mod 6. Okay, and then likewise for 104. So 104 minus 2 is 102. And let's see, is that a multiple of 6? I believe that's 60 plus 42, so this should be uh, 17 times 6. So that tells us that 6 divides 104 minus 2. So that means that 104 is indeed congruent to 2 mod 6. Okay, and now let's check uh, in part B here whether we can really add those two congruences from part A together. Um, so this is these are all just kind of like going down through the, the different parts of the theorem like that. Okay, so let's try it. So 45 plus 104 is going to be um, 149. Okay, and then um, the other side, uh, 3 plus 2 is going to be 5. Okay, so let's see what happens if I do 149 minus 5. Are those really congruent mod 6? So that's going to be 144, and then 144, um, that's 12 times 12, so I think this should be um, 6 times 24. Um, so this difference here of the left-hand side and the right-hand side, they are um, separated by a multiple of 6. Uh, so that does mean uh, that 149 is indeed congruent to 5 mod 6. Okay, and then for part C, uh, that's a C, not an O. So for part C, uh, I'm going to subtract. So 45 minus 104 is, uh, let's see, I believe that's negative 59. And then for the right hand side, uh, 3 minus 2 is negative 1. So let's see what we do, or what we get when we do the difference. So negative 59 minus negative 1, that is going to be uh, negative, uh, oops, I, I think I just realized this is, this is supposed to be positive 1, right? Um, so this here should be, excuse me, uh, that should be 1, and then so this will be 60. Uh, okay, negative 60 rather. So that is 6 times negative 10. So that means that 6 does divide negative um, 59 minus 1. So negative 59 is congruent to 1 mod 6. Okay, and then part D. So if we multiply them, 45 times 104. I'm going to have to get a calculator out for this. This is 4,680. And of course, uh, 3 times 2 is 6. And then um, I'm just going to try to squish this in here. Uh, so 4680 minus 6 is 4674. And then if we divide that by 6, or we factor a 6 out of it, we get 6 times 779. So that means that 6 does divide this difference here. Uh, so um, 4680 
is congruent to um, 6 mod 6. Sorry, I'm getting a little cramped in the corner here. Uh, and then finally, 45 squared is 20, 25. And 3 squared is obviously 9. And then if we subtract those, so 20, 25 minus 9 uh, is going to be 20, 16. And if we divide by 6, or factor a 6, we get 336. So that means that 6 does divide this difference here between the two sides. Uh, so 2025 is indeed congruent to 9 mod 6. Okay, so we confirmed that the uh, four statements in the theorem are true, at least when A is uh, 45, C is 3, B is 104, and D is 2. Okay, so here's your homework problem. So you're to verify this theorem uh, for these numbers below. So give that a try and then check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now let's do uh, something a little more, I think, interesting, at least to me, <laughs> uh, which is to prove these following statements here. So I'm going to do 9 part B and 10. And so we're assuming in both of these that A, B, C, D, and N are integers with N greater than 1, and A being congruent to C mod N, and B is congruent to D mod N. So I'm going to start with 9B. So I'll go ahead and just write down the things that we are allowed to assume in these. So we're assuming A, B, C, D, and N are integers uh, with n being greater than 1, and furthermore that a is congruent to c mod n, and that b is congruent to d mod n. Okay, and then so what we will show in this one is we will show um, that a minus, oops, that's not an a, that a minus b is congruent to c minus d mod n. Okay, so this is not um, too bad, and so what I'm going to use is the fact that we had in that previous theorem, uh, we had a bunch of different equivalent ways of stating what it means for a to be congruent to c mod n, or for b to be congruent to d mod n. So I'm going to cite that previous theorem. So I'm going to say the following, since uh, a is congruent to C mod N. There is some integer, and we can call it whatever we want. Um, I guess I'll just call it, I don't know, J, such that A is equal to C plus NJ. And then I'm going to do uh, the exact same thing for the other congruence that we're assuming is true. So I'm going to say since uh, b is congruent to d mod n, there is some integer, this time I'll call it k, such that b is equal to d plus n k. Okay, so now that I've translated my congruences into equations, what I can do at this point is I can actually use what I know about equations. And one thing you know about equations already is that you can subtract them, right? So then we can subtract these two equations to get so I'm going to do the left side minus the left side equals the right side minus the right side. Okay. And so what have I got now? So now I'm going to rearrange just a little bit. Um, so this also equals, if I just simplify that a little bit, I get C plus D. And then I have uh, plus NJ minus, oops, I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a minus on the D. C minus D plus NJ minus NK, and I can factor out an N from those last two terms to get J minus K for the other factor. OK, 
Okay, so look at what we've got here. So we have that a, oops, a minus b equals c minus d plus n times j minus k. And so since j minus k is an integer, so I'm going to refer to that previous theorem again, where um, being able to write uh, an equation of this form that actually means or is equivalent to the fact that a minus b is congruent to c minus d mod n. Okay, so that's it. It's not uh, not too tricky, I think, as long as you're able to use that equivalent form of when you have a modular equation, you get a regular equation um, where you have a plus n times some integer. Okay, so now let's try uh, doing number 10. So I'm going to do it just uh, pretty much exactly the same way. So proof. So we're going to assume, I'll write all the things we're assuming again. So a, b, c, d, and n are integers with n greater than 1. Uh, and a is congruent. So the only one I actually need this time is that a is congruent to c mod n, because b and d are not mentioned at all. So I'll just use that one. Okay, so then uh, since a is congruent to c mod n, that means one of the things that it means, there's various ways to, uh, various things you could say at this point, like for example that a minus c is divisible by n, um, but one of those equivalences that we had on that theorem was that a equals c plus uh, n, and I'll call it k this time, uh, for some integer k. All right, um, so now that I have an equation, I can do equation-y stuff to it. And one of the things you can always do with an equation is you can square both sides. So a squared will equal c plus nk squared. And then I can simplify that right-hand side. I can foil it out. So I'll get c squared plus 2cnk plus uh, nk squared. And then I can simplify that a little bit uh, more. So let's see, what can I do? 2c and k, this can be n squared k squared. And then I think I can factor out an n um, from the last two terms. So if I factor, oops, that's supposed to be a plus. Factor out an n, that leaves me with 2ck and then plus n k squared. Okay, and now, um, so what we have here, if I go from the first part, a squared, all the way to the last part, is a squared equals c squared plus this thing here, this is a multiple of n. Okay, so we've already got almost to the end here, where this, uh, I keep making typos, um, so this part here is an integer. So this is telling us that a squared is congruent to c squared uh, mod n. So if you're able to write two numbers um, in an equation like this where one equals the other plus a multiple of n, then those two numbers are congruent modulo n. And uh, that's it. So uh, here's number nine, part a. Uh, so go ahead and give this a try. You can do it exactly the same way that I just did the last two, and then check the answer in the back of the book. Okay, so let's look at an example of how we can put corollary 8.4.4 to some very practical use that will be incredibly useful in uh, encryption algorithms. So what this corollary is really telling us is that if you are not so much interested in the value of a, b, as in what it is congruent to modulo n, then what you can do is you can actually do the mod n operation to both parts of that product. You can do it to a and you can do it to b, and that will tell you what a, b is congruent to modulo n. And that is really, really useful. And you can also do that when you're raising a number to an exponent. If you don't actually care what a to the m is, but you just care what it is congruent to modulo m, or sorry, modulo n, then you can do the mod n operation um, to the number that is being raised to that exponent. 
And uh, that's really useful because it allows us to calculate things that would otherwise kind of be beyond our reach. Like, for example, this number right here, that is a number that's so large that um, it's impossible to calculate what it is without using an algorithm like this to do mod 713. Um, so in other words, most, most modern calculators would not be able to hold that value in, it, in their memory because they would overrun uh, the memory for that. Uh, so, but if you do want to know what this is, just mod 713, so not what the actual number 89 to the 307 is, but what it is congruent to, modulo 713, or what its remainder is after division by 713, then there's a much easier way to actually do this, and I'm going to show you that right now. So let us do uh, number 17, and this problem is a little long, but uh, I think you'll get a really good idea of how this technique works. So I'm going to start by writing 89 to the 307, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to break this exponent up in the following manner. So this is going to be 89 to the 1 times, okay, I'm already making typos, times 89 to the 306. And the reason I've done this is because I want to get an even exponent. So this is going to be 89 times, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor that exponent like this, uh, so this is going to be 153. So the reason I can do this is because 2 times 153 is 306. So this is just using uh, some rules of exponents. And now what I can do is I can actually go ahead and square 89. And when I do that, I get 7,921. Okay, so now what I can do is I can actually apply the mod 713 operation to that 7921. And now I'm not going to write the equal sign, I'm going to write the congruence sign right there, because what I'm getting is now a different number than what I had before. So it's not the same number anymore, but it is a number that is congruent to what I had before, mod 713. And that's all I'm really interested in. Okay, so... Now what I need to do is I need to actually calculate um, what this is. So there are several ways you could go about doing this. Um, most calculators do have a function in there somewhere. You might need to consult um, your calculator's manual or Google how to do it on your particular calculator model. Uh, you could also just go to Wolfram Alpha and type in that little phrase there and it will tell you what it is. Um, if all you had was, for example, a four function calculator, then there's a couple of ways you could keep you could do this. Um, you could just repeatedly subtract copies of 713 from 7921 until you get down to something that is smaller than 713. Um, but even that is a bit too time consuming if you ask me. So probably the easiest way to do this uh, is to just take and divide um, 17 or sorry 7921 by 713, and then you get something that is approximately 11.11, um, and then what you want to do then is you want to do 7921, and then you're going to subtract 11 copies of 713 to get uh, 78. Okay, so what this means is that 7921 mod 713 is 78. Okay, so you could have also found that out by just subtracting 713, but you would have had to do it 11 times, um, so that is a little more time consuming that way. So that's how you calculate that if you don't have a good calculator. Um, and as we go through this problem, I'm just going to assume that you know how to do all those little mod operations, that you figured out some way to do it that works for you, and I'm just going to uh, write down what they all are um, as I go along uh, without really pausing over them. Okay, so this is going to be so simplifying what I had before, I now have 89 times 78 to the 153. So look at what an improvement that is, because we started out with an exponent that was 307, and we're already down to 153. That's a huge improvement. It, it basically, if you would write down whatever 89 to the 307 is, you've now halved the amount of space that it takes to write down that number. Okay, but let's keep going, because this is still not um, a manageable size. It's still way, way, way too big. Okay, so I'm going to do just exactly the same thing that I just did before. So this is going to be 78 to the 1, and then 78 to the 152, and then I'm going to split up the 152 exponent. So I'm going to actually group the 89 and the 78 together, and I'm going to uh, treat those uh, separately. And then this is going to be 78 squared raised to the uh, 76. Okay, and then I'm going to do... Uh, 89 times 78 is 6,942, and then 78 squared is 6,084. 
Okay, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the mod operation again. And so again, I'm writing this three bar equivalence because I'm getting a number that is not the same number that I had before, but it is a number that is congruent modulo 713. Okay, so I'm going to do the mod 713 to this number, and I'm also going to do it to this number. And again, I'm just going to assume that you know how to do that. So I'm just going to write down what I got. Um, and I was actually using um, Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> so this will be 525 and 380. Okay, and now I have an even exponent. Uh, so I'm going to just write this as 380 squared uh, raised to the 38, because 2 times 38 is 76. Okay, and so 380 squared is, uh, oops, 380 squared is 100 and, nope, 144,400, and that's to the 38. So we've the exponent has come down quite a bit already, but uh, we're still not quite at the finish line yet. So let's keep going. So I'm going to do another mod uh, 713 operation, and so here I'm going to write the triple line again instead of equals because this is not the same number, but it is congruent modulo 713. Okay, and so that will be... I just have these all written down on a sheet of paper. Uh, 374. Okay, and so I'm going to do this again. So I got another even exponent, so just once more I'm going to break this into 374 squared, and then that'll be to the 19, because 2 times 19 is 38. Sorry, that's neither an equal sign nor a congruence. Let's make it an equal equal sign. Okay, so this is going to be 139,876 to the 19, and then I'm just going to do mod 713 again. And now hopefully you're getting the idea now. You just keep going like this. Just keep going, keep going, keep going. This time it is 128. That is a 9. Okay, so now I have another odd exponent, so I'm going to break it up um, similarly to before. So this will be one copy of 128 out here, and then I'm going to have 18 copies over here. And then now that I have the 18, which is an even exponent, um, I'm going to put these two together in their own little parenthesis, and then I'm going to have 128 squared to the 9. Okay, and then I'm going to do, so 525 times 128 is 67,200, and then 128 squared is 16,384. Okay, and now I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay, so just uh, picking up, this is number 17 continued. And what we had on the last slide was um, 67,200 times uh, 6,384 to the uh, 9. Okay, so I'm going to do the mod 713 operation to both of these again. Okay, and I'm just, uh, like I said, I'm just using Wolfram Alpha to get those um, those little moduluses there. So this is going to be 178, and this one is going to be 698. Okay, and then we got an odd exponent, so I'm just going to use the same trick, um, just repeatedly. So 698, I'll break off one copy, and then there's eight other copies, and then I'm going to factor that eight. So I'll put these two together. And then this will be 698 uh, squared, and then to the fourth. Okay, so this is going to be 124, 244, and this one is going to be 487,204. And I'm going to do the mod operation again, so this is going to be a triple line there.
Okay, and then I'm using Wolfram Alpha to find those. So we get uh, 182 and 225 to the fourth. Okay, so we're like almost at the end. This is now actually a manageable number. Um, you could just go straight to the end, but let me just keep going uh, the way I have been doing it. So I got an even exponent, so I'm gonna break this into 225 squared and then squared again. And so this is gonna be 182 times uh, 50,625 squared. And I'm gonna do one more, mod 713. And let's see what we get. So the reason I think this is actually kind of fun is it's, it kind of like reminds me of the process of like whacking through a jungle or something with a machete. You're just like hacking and slashing at those numbers with this with the mod 713 and they just um, get smaller and smaller in, in a way that is, in my opinion, kind of satisfying. Um, so this is actually going to be two. So this will be, oops. Okay, so this is 182 and then this, this one is two squared. So we get 182 times four. And 182 times 4 is 728. And so the final 713, mod 713 operation we're going to do is to that. And so for that one, you just have to subtract 713 once and you get 15. Yay, 15, we did it. Um, so that was kind of long and involved. So I think I'm going to skip over doing number 18, but uh, let me show you some homework for you to try. Okay, so here are some homework problems for you. Uh, 14 and 15, I think they're not very hard at all because the exponent is kind of small, uh, but you do just want to use that same technique that we were talking about. And uh, then on number 16, it looks about as hard as the one I did, so that one potentially may take you a very long time. Uh, so go ahead and try those and check your answers in the back of the book. Okay, so now that we've learned how to do uh, fast exponentiation, um, so that allows us to find uh, really large numbers uh, modulo another number, let's talk now about how to solve equations. So this is another thing that's going to be really important for encryption and decryption. Remember that we started off um, earlier in this section by talking about the concept of needing functions that are invertible in order to do our encryptions with, so this will be important. So let's review, first of all, when you're solving an equation where x is a real number, uh, you have an equation like this, for example, where 2x equals 3. You know that you solve this by dividing both sides of the equation by 2 to get x equals 3 over 2. Another way to think of that, an equivalent way to think of it, is that you're multiplying both sides of the equation by 1 half. So if I do that on both sides, 1 half multiplied on both sides, the 1 half and the 2 are going to cancel out to give you 1 for the exponent on the left. So you would have 1x equals 1 half times 3, which is 3 halves. So this 1 half, it is called the multiplicative inverse of 2, because that's the number that you multiply by to basically undo multiplication by 2. So if you want to undo something, the undoing thing is called the inverse. Okay, so 1 half is the multiplicative inverse of 2. Now what if we wanted to solve um, a similar uh, relation like this, it looks similar, but it's not actually an equation, it's a congruence modulo 5. So I want to know when does 2x, uh, when is 2x congruent to 3 modulo 5? So 2x doesn't necessarily have to equal 3, it just is congruent to 3 mod 5. So here what we're looking for are the all of the integer values of x that will satisfy uh, this equation. So for example, one value of x that would satisfy that would be 4, because 2 times 4 is 8, and 8 is congruent to 3 modulo 5. Um, another value that would satisfy that would be, would be x equals 9, because 2 times 9 would be 18, and 18 is congruent to 3 modulo 5. So those are the kind of solutions that we're looking for. But in this situation, uh, multiplying by 1 half or dividing by 2 will actually not help us at all, because what would happen is that Okay, we would get the 1 half would cancel the 2 on the left, but what happens on the right is then you have 3 halves, um, and you have 3 halves modulo 5, but 3 halves is not an integer, and none of the other things that are congruent to 3 halves modulo 5 are integers either. So that's, that's not even, it's, it's not giving us solutions at all. So what we need is, is something completely different. So let me show you what you can actually do. Okay, so here is something that will unexpectedly help. Um, so if you were solving 
two x equals three and you wanted real number solutions and it was just a regular equation, multiplying by three wouldn't help you at all. But in this situation, multiplying by three is exactly what you want to do. So let me show you why. So when you multiply on both sides by three, you get three times two x on the left and then you get three times three on the right. And so you have six x is congruent to nine modulo five. And then what we can do is we can do that same process that we were doing with the with that long fast exponentiation problem where you can take everything and do the mod 5 operation to it. Okay, so that means that I can replace this 6 here with 6 mod 5. And what is 6 mod 5? That's 1. And then I can also of course do 9 mod 5 and that would give me 4. Uh, but the really important thing here is that we get 1 times x. So that means that the solutions to this congruence are when x is congruent to 4 mod 5. You remember I said that um, 4 was one of the solutions and um, uh, 9 was one of the other solutions and I knew those because I knew how to solve this of course. Um, but anyway these are the values of x that will satisfy this congruence. So this is interesting because we multiplied 2 by 3 and we got 6 and it turns out that 6 is congruent to 1. So what does this mean? This means that 3 is actually the inverse of 2 modulo 5. We can call 3 the inverse of 2 modulo 5 because 3 is the number that we would multiply by in a congruence mod 5 equation in order to undo multiplication by 2. Just like I just showed you on that last slide, it is the number that will take away that 2 coefficient and leave you with 1. So this is exactly um, the kind of thing that we want if we're going to be solving congruences modulo n, and we do need to be able to solve those in order to do encryption and decryption. Now, unfortunately, not every number has an inverse modulo n, but we do at least have theorems that tell us when those inverses exist. So let's look at those. Okay, so here are the definitions and the theorems that we need in order to understand when inverses modulo n exist. So first of all, we need the concept of relatively prime. And this is a, a very simple concept. So integers a and b are called relatively prime if and only if their greatest common denominator, their GCD, is equal to 1. So that means that a and b do not share any factors. That's why they're called relatively prime. They're, they're sort of prime from each other's point of view in that they don't share factors. You can also define the concept of relatively prime for a bunch of integers, like a list of integers. Um, if none of them share any factors with each other, uh, then they are all pairwise relatively prime. Okay, so the next thing we need is the concept uh, in corollary 8.4.6. So if a and b are relatively prime integers, then there exist integers s and t, such that we can write a times s plus b times t equals 1. Okay, so that, that might seem a little bit not so useful, but it actually directly gives us the next corollary, corollary 8.4.7, the existence of inverses modulo n. So for all integers a and n, if their GCD, the GCD of a and n, is equal to 1, then there exists an integer s such that a times s is congruent to 1 modulo n. And this integer s, that is called the inverse of a modulo n, because that's the number that if you wanted to get rid of a coefficient of a, you would multiply by s in a congruence modulo n relation. Uh, and then that would leave you with 1, and then you would be able to solve. Okay? So, um, the reason that a times s is congruent to 1 uh, mod n has actually directly to do with corollary 8.4.6, okay, because if gcd of a and n is equal to 1, then what we can say is there exists integers s and t such that, sorry, it's a little floppy over here, um, such that a s plus n t equals 1. So that's coming from this corollary right here. So I'm just using n instead of b. And then what I can do is I can say, okay, um, I can move the n t to the other side of the equation like this, 1 minus n t. And you remember that if you're able to write um, an equation like this, where I'm going to write it like this, where I have the negative t like that, where you have a s is equal to 1 plus a multiple of n, then this directly means that a s is congruent to 1 mod n. Okay, that was one of those equivalences that we looked at when we were talking about what the meaning of congruence mod n is. 
Um, so that uh, directly leads into corollary 8.4.7. So if your if your coefficient a is um, relatively prime to the modulus, uh, then you will be able to apply the inverse of a modulo n. You can find it; it will actually exist. Okay, everybody, so I think we're going to leave it there for today because this is getting a little long. Um, there's still quite a few important concepts to cover in this section, um, especially how to actually calculate an inverse modulo n, and then uh, we're going to apply the concepts that we've just been learning about to the RS RSA crypto system, which is actually a modern encryption algorithm that you're going to learn how to encrypt and decrypt with. Uh, so look forward to that next time. Uh, don't forget uh, that you should be working on your test, and there was also a quiz on Monday, and there will be a quiz after this section as well, so uh, please keep up with those quizzes. Uh, send me an email if you're having any troubles, you need any help, you want to do a video chat, or you want to just uh, talk, anything is fine, um, and I'll see you guys next time.